Hi guys. Um, welcome to the second water resources lecture. Um, we're going to try this a little bit differently and I'm going to send you a recording for this one. Um, let me know what you prefer the, the live in well in person, uh, the live um, lectures on zoom or these recordings that you can watch whenever is convenient for you. Um, all right, so let's jump right on into into it. Um, so we're gonna pick up where we left off um, from the last water resources uh, lecture and we're gonna start talking about water quality. <clears throat> All right, so um, a couple of basics that you guys need to know about water quality. Uh, the first thing is about water pollution. So we've already talked about air pollution, um, similar concept. So water pollution, the def definition uh, in your book is that it's the contamination of streams, rivers, lakes, oceans, or groundwater with substances produced by human activities or through human activities. Um, one specific type of water pollution is wastewater. Um, and this is specifically water that's produced by livestock operations or human activities, uh, including human sewage from toilets and gray water from bathing, washing of clothes and dishes. All right, so basically anything that goes down a drain is wastewater, whether it's animal waste or human waste, wastewater. Um, and just as with air pollution, we have two main categories of um, water pollution point source, which has it's come from a distinct location um, where that pollution is produced or non point source, it comes from like a wide variety of areas. So point source uh, usually is like a pipe or a canal or a ditch or something that the the pollution comes from um, versus non-point sources where it's like kind of washing off of a whole bunch of fields or like washing off of a whole bunch of um, city streets or something like that. Um, this diagram does have animal feedlots on there um, and in a lot of circumstances animal feedlots are actually considered point source pollution uh, because you can identify like where that's coming from um, most of the time. So some of the things that we're concerned about with wastewater, um, the first one is eutrophication. Um, I clearly didn't label my slides well. Um, so eutrophication is when a body of water becomes really, really rich in nutrients. Um, and a lot of time, this can happen naturally or it can happen from human causes. Um, so if it's sources like fertilizer or uh, pet waste, um, then that might be cultural eutrophication uh, or the result of anthropogenic or human inputs of nutrients. Um, if the excess nutrients are coming from wild animals or uh, just excessive plant matter, like in the fall, um, sometimes when leaves fall down and wash into uh, rivers and lakes, that can happen then as well. Um, eutrophication, the excess nutrients can cause uh, rapid growth of algae um, so because a lot of times, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus uh, that are getting into the water, those are limiting nutrients for plant growth. And so when the, the algae um, or the, the single-celled uh, photosynthetic organisms, um, when they have access to more of those limited resources, then they can kind of grow a lot faster. Um, so it'll cause an algal bloom a lot of times. Uh, and then when that algae eventually dies, then all of the little microbes will come and um, decompose it and eat it up. And um, that uh, will cause the, those microbes will increase the biological oxygen demand of the water. So the microbes are using up the oxygen in the water that maybe like fish might use otherwise. Um, and that can result in a, a dead zone or a hypoxic zone. So, um, where there's not enough oxygen for uh, fish or other organisms in the water and that can result in a fish kill. Um, so there's a very iconic, I guess, dead zone um, that pops up every summer in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so this is Louisiana. So the, the Mississippi River drains a lot of agricultural land. And so all, um, if there are any excess nutrients in that water, which there tend to be, um, then uh, 
all of those excess nutrients go into the Gulf of Mexico. And in the summertime, when it gets nice and warm, um, those algae are super, super active. They have access to a ton of the nutrients that are usually limited, um, phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, and so they grow a lot and then that algal bloom will die. All the organism or the microorganisms will decompose it and use up all the oxygen in the water and create a hypoxic or an anoxic zone. So hypoxic just means low oxygen, anoxic means no oxygen. Um, some other concerns associated with wastewater is that there might be disease causing organisms in water. Um, so some of you had these diseases uh, in the call the doctor project. Um, so if we in in countries that don't have um, more advanced uh, water technology, um, a lot of times the same water source is used for drinking, bathing and sewage or wastewater disposal. Um, and so because of that, uh, wastewater can carry a lot of different pathogens, including cholera, typhoid fever, stomach flu, which stomach flu is just a generic name for anything that makes your stomach upset. It's not really the flu necessarily, because the flu, as we know, is a respiratory virus. Um, diarrhea, which can be a symptom of these. Cholera is listed twice, so maybe it's important. Um, and hepatitis, um, particularly, I believe it's hepatitis A. Uh, is is foodborne and uh, and fecal material. So a lot of these are um, transmitted, especially cholera, typhoid, and um, hepatitis A uh, through fecal material in water. So one way that we can um, test wastewater or test um, water to see if there might be a high likelihood of disease causing organisms is um, to look for an indicator species or a group of indicator species. Um, and these are a group of species that, you know, tend to grow in the same conditions that maybe disease causing pathogens <clears throat> also like, um, but maybe these indicator species aren't necessarily harmful um, or they're like often found in the same kind of uh, conditions. Um, and one of these that we look for in water is fecal coliform bacteria. Um, I spent a lot of time culturing these in grad school uh, when I looked at water samples every month from the same stream. Um, so we'll take water from a water source and filter it and then grow um, the, the bacteria on a plate uh, with a little grid and you look and see how many colonies form of this fecal coliform bacteria. You're looking for um, things like E. coli uh, and other species that is commonly found in fecal matter. Um, and you're looking for there to be less than a certain number of um, colony forming units there to say that it's safe. So with wastewater to make sure that these contaminants don't get into maybe like a river that people are going to go catch fish from or uh, that we're going to then filter for drinking water or something like that. Um, we generally treat our wastewater and there are a couple of common ways to do that. Um, in low density housing, so in, in areas where you have a fair amount of land available to you, um, people tend to use septic systems. And so this is a fairly simple sewage treatment system. Um, again, it's often used in homes uh, in rural areas because it's kind of a standalone system. You don't need to be connected to a larger system, um, but it does take up a lot of space. So it's composed of a couple of key components. So you have uh, a septic tank. So when you flush the toilet or when the water goes down the sink or the shower drain, um, it goes down this pipe and out into a big septic tank. <coughs> And so that's just a big tank that's receiving the wastewater um, and it, the, the heavier things kind of settle to the bottom of it. Um, and that's called sludge, the solid waste material from wastewater. Um, and then septage is the, the liquid. Uh, and so that will tend to float on top and that flows out this smaller pipe um, and into a leach field. Uh, so it's a series of, of pipes. So you're piping this, um, septage water uh, into a, a fairly large area of soil um, and in underground perforated pipes or and then that's slowly releasing the water into the soil um, and then the, the physical properties of the soil so like just the the, the nature of like the small um, small gaps between sediments as well as the bacteria that hang out in the soil 
will um, naturally kind of filter out. Uh, they'll digest a lot of the nutrients that they're found in um, human waste, as well as um, uh, the soil will kind of hold on to any solid particles that make it that far as well. So there are certain soils that are suitable to having septic tanks. You need to have kind of like a Goldilocks level of drainage um, in your soil. So it can't be too clay heavy and it also can't go too fast through the soil because then the bacteria don't have a chance to um, interact with the, the septage and digest those nutrients. Um, so uh, you do have to have a fairly specific type of soil for this to work. Um, and also again, a fairly large area. And this area is gonna depend it's going to be sized according to the size of the house or the number of people that might be using the bathroom in the house. So since that's clearly not good for like really high density uh, living areas, um, we had to come up with another way to treat our wastewater um, once, you know, humans started living in, in closer proximity to each other and in smaller uh, lots. So um, this is a more advanced, like a wastewater treatment plant. Um, so there are a couple of stages here. So the first stage is that we have these underground pipes that are carrying waste uh, to the treatment plant. And then once it gets there, it goes through a series of large screens. Um, so people flush all sorts of weird things down the toilet. Um, those flushable wipes, they are not flushable. Uh, they actually just get screened out and sent to the landfill. So if you use them, you might as well stick them in the trash can yourself or just not use them. Um, uh, people put like feminine hygiene products down there, diapers, all these things, they don't go down the toilet. Uh, they clog the lines, but if they don't clog the lines, then they make it all the way here and they just get screened out and put in the trash can and they go to the landfill. Um, so, so that's preliminary treatment is where the screening of the trash out. And then we go into the primary treatment. So this is a physical process. Um, all of the big heavy things so the solid human waste uh, and any like sand or grit or things like that that happen to get in there as well, um, those will settle down to the bottom of the tank. So it's just a big tank and you let things sit and gravity does its thing. Um, so these solids are then um, pumped out and um, they're dewatered in another part of the wastewater treatment. Um, so the liquid from the primary treatment is sent on. So this is where the majority of the, um, the excess nitrogen and phosphorus compounds are found. And so it goes into secondary treatment. So secondary treatment is where you have um, bacteria that are naturally occurring in human waste. Um, there's some like activated sludge down here. So remember sludge is just the name for solid human waste. Um, and so the bacteria that are naturally occurring there, um, they act in this water and they break down those nitrogen and phosphorus compounds um, so that we're not releasing them back out into the water sources and causing algal blooms. Um, and to facilitate this process, a lot of times the uh, this secondary treatment is aerated. Um, so they add water bubbles to the treatment um, to help those bacteria digest uh, and, and metabolize those nitrogen and phosphorus compounds even faster. Um, and then if there is any solids, then that also gets pumped down, or that sinks down to the bottom of this tank as well and gets pumped out here um, to dewater it. So this dewatering happens um, usually by heating it. Um, it smells terrible uh, if you ever get to see it. And then um, this uh, dewatered dehydrated solid waste um, can then be uh, pumped out into a or transferred into a truck um, and then it can be spread on land um, and used as a fertilizer but for crops that are not going to be eaten by humans um, or it can be burned in some cases to decrease its mass um, that also smells terrible. Um, so after secondary treatment, then the liquid continues on to tertiary treatment. Um, and in tertiary treatment, depending on how much space is available, uh, the cost, like the operating cost of the plant and that sort of thing, um, then this water is either exposed to ultraviolet light or um, chemicals like chlorine to kill any pathogens that might be left. Um, and then it is 
uh, if it was exposed to chlorine, then you have to dechlorinate it as well because you don't want the naturally occurring bacteria in the river to like be killed uh, from your chlorine. Um, and so then this uh, water can, so it gets dechlorinated or if you use UV light, then it just you know goes right back out into the river or lake um, downstream. Ideally, um, people tend to pull in their drinking water from upstream and discharge their wastewater downstream, um, partially because that's how gravity works best. Uh, so, you know, you have the advantage of having gravity to flow, uh, help the water flow towards the, um, the, the wastewater treatment plant and then out into the river. And then this water that was discharged from the wastewater treatment plant goes downstream to the next town that then takes it in uh, and uses it for their drinking water and for all their water purposes. So this is why wastewater treatment plants are super de duper important. They do an excellent job of cleaning uh, all the pathogens out of the water, all the excess nutrients out of the water, uh, out of the wastewater, so that it's clean enough and safe enough um, for the next town to, uh, to consume, as well as for us to maybe like think about swimming in that same lake or river. Um, and then, Another component uh, that was a, uh, a part of what we consider wastewater is livestock waste. Um, so this is a big concern, especially in Eastern North Carolina. Um, so North Carolina is routinely like the number, the top two or three um, hog producer in the country. We're usually like second to Iowa. Um, so we have a lot of pigs, especially in the Cape Fear and the Noose River Basins. Um, and so, and then uh, other, other states have a lot of chickens and, and turkeys and other livestock that we keep um, in high concentrated areas. And this is a very efficient way of farming um, animals. However, it does result in a large amount of animal waste uh, in one area. So we typically store these in manure lagoons. Um, sometimes you'll hear them called hog lagoons or cess ponds. Um, so these are human made ponds. They're lined with some sort of non-porous material, uh, a rubber, a plastic or something like that um, to hold large quantities of manure produced by livestock. So um, a lot of, uh, large volume livestock operations, they routinely feed the animals antibiotics and livestock or, and hormones so that they grow faster. Um, also because they're kept in such close quarters, uh, the antibiotics can help um, present, prevent disease spread uh, in such close quarters. Um, so once this, so the animals, they'll, they'll go to the bathroom, it's on the floor, it usually gets hosed off through um, some grates in the floor and then it goes to these ponds. Um, and then that manure is broken down by the bacteria that are naturally found in the waste, in the lagoon, um, kind of like with human wastewater treatment. Um, and then the liquid will be oftentimes sprayed or onto non-food crop fields uh, as fertilizers. Um, and then the solids can also be spread onto non-food crop fields as fertilizers. Um, so as you can imagine, when the, this water is being sprayed on fields, it doesn't smell real, really good. Um, and there's a lot of hazardous materials in it. Uh, but the main one is ammonia um, from the urine. And um, this is a huge environmental justice issue, especially in North Carolina. Um, people who live near these farms, uh, they have much higher instances of respiratory illness than other folks who live in the same communities. Um, and because like this, this liquid waste is being sprayed, it's kind of aerosolized into the air. And so nearby uh, houses or near, people who live nearby um, can just breathe in those aerosols. Um, and so people have higher instances of asthma and other lung diseases. Um, and uh, recently in North Carolina, um, our General Assembly passed a law that said that uh, I believe ending in December 2020, um, people who live near these farms are not allowed to sue the, the, the livestock farms for um, injury or nuisance, um, which is a pretty big concern considering the, 
the health effects um, that are faced. And then folks who live near these farms, their property values are lower because it can be kind of smelly when they're spraying this um, uh, animal waste around. And so folks might not wanna buy those properties. And so people are, are kind of stuck living there um, because they, they can't sell their houses very easily. Um, so it's a, it's a huge environmental justice issue. I don't know what else to say other than that about it. Um, another issue uh, that we're concerned about with water is heavy metal pollution. Um, I know you guys did a project in chemistry about lead in pipes uh, with Flint, Michigan as your kind of uh, real life example. So lead can be found in pipes and other older construction materials. Uh, when we ingest it, either like drinking it, eating it or inhaling it, um, it can result in nervous system dysfunction uh, and developmental delays in children um, and lowered I So things like lowered IQ or, um, or any nervous system function can be damaged. So an example of this uh, is Flint, Michigan. Um, so in 2014, they stopped buying water from Detroit and they switched over to the Flint River because they figured out that it was going to save them a ton of money. Um, and Flint is not a super uh, economically well off, I guess, city. Uh, but I mean, any city wants to save money. Um, so and then when they did this, they stopped using an additive that Detroit had used. Uh, to coat the pipes, the old lead pipes, um, to prevent corrosion. And so, and the water from the Flint River also was a little bit more acidic. And so the, the water started to corrode the pipes, it started to rust the pipes. And so that lead started to leach into the water as it flowed through those pipes. Um, and so somehow people figured this out and um, they did water tests in 2015. Uh, and they found that the concentration of lead was much, much higher than five parts per billion, which is the EPA uh, maximum uh, acceptable level. So eventually in 2015, the um, Flint, Michigan water system was reconnected to the Detroit water supply. Uh, however, because those pipes went so long without that coating, um, they are still leaching lead into water into drinking water that's coming into people's homes and it's still, um, you know, six, six years later um, is a huge problem for them there. Another heavy metal that uh, can get into our water uh, is arsenic. So arsenic can occur naturally. Um, it's found in some rocks where people might draw groundwater from, so in the bedrock. Um, and then also it can get into uh, groundwater through human activities um, such as mining or uh, additives that we might add to, to products in, in manufacturing. Um, it's a, a preservative a lot of times. Um, so it can, exposure to arsenic and especially consuming arsenic can be associated with skin, bladder, kidney, and lung cancer. Um, it is fairly easy to remove with a common um, a common water filter, um, but I mean, it does need to be a fairly powerful water filter. So like just the Brita filter pitcher um, isn't gonna cut it. So it is really important, um, especially for folks who use groundwater uh, because this is naturally occurring. We do have high levels of arsenic in some bedrock in North Carolina. So it is really important for folks who use groundwater to get their water tested fairly frequently uh, for heavy metals to make sure that this is safe. Um, and if arsenic or other heavy metals are found in the water, um, then it's really important to get a filter uh, installed in your pump house or at the house level um, to filter that out. In, the, in 1999, um, the EPA lowered the limit of acceptable arsenic levels in water from 50 down to 10 parts per billion. I believe the National Academy of Sciences or some other um, nonprofit organization had actually recommended that the uh, limit be set at five parts per billion, um, but the EPA stuck with 10 um, for, for whatever reasons. Um, an example of arsenic 
a mass arsenic poisoning um, from a water source in Bangladesh and India in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, there was a lot of surface pollution. And so um, unconfined groundwater aquifers, as well as surface waters had high levels of pollution in them. And so they drilled deep down uh, to find groundwater wells to get uncontaminated drinking water. However, uh, they did not know that the bedrock that they were drilling into had high arsenic concentrations. And so the groundwater that was found in these confined aquifers um, had high arsenic concentrations naturally. And so there were a lot of people in Bangladesh and India who were um, poisoned with arsenic. Uh, arsenic poisoning has some characteristic telltale signs, but only once you get pretty high concentrations of it in your body. Um, you can get lines on your fingernails. Um, I believe these are called knees lines uh, and also spots on dark spots on um, your skin, especially on your hands. Um, but again, these are only very high concentrations. So here is a map um, of areas in the United States that have bedrock that is particularly high in arsenic concentration. Um, and again, these are kind of averages across the board. Um, in Union County, North Carolina, we have actually one of the, I think it's like the fourth or fifth highest um, concentrations in groundwater wells that have been found in the US. Um, uh, mercury is another concern of a heavy metal pollutant that we might find in water. It occurs naturally, um, again, in some soils and rocks, but mainly mercury gets into water through human activity, primarily burning coal. Um, and then the second, I guess, leading contr contributor is from cement manufacturing, from the limestone that we use to manufacture cement. Uh, but it's primarily from burning coal. When we burn the coal, the mercury is present as an impurity. And so that gets released into the atmosphere. Um, and then that eventually precipitates down into water sources. And then it's taken up uh, in the soil and then by plants and then by bacteria. Um, and it goes on up the food chain and it can bioaccumulate in um, food chains. Um, I left my uh, example of arsenic here. Sorry, guys. Um, the, the largest source of human exposure is eating fish and shellfish. Um, this is why a lot of times uh, you'll see recommendations like to only eat, especially large fish like tuna, um, fairly infrequently. So only like once or twice a week. Um, and for pregnant women, uh, again, because developing fetuses are more susceptible to damage from heavy metals, um, it's important for pregnant women to be very careful about how much fish and shellfish that they are eating. Um, about half of the uh, mercury in the atmosphere and in our waters um, has been traced back to coming from Asia. Um, and a lot of our uh, regulations in North America for um, coal burning uh, can prevent the mercury from getting into the atmosphere uh, by preventing particulate pollution with scrubbers. So acid deposition um, is another concern of uh, issues of things that might pollute water. So again, acid deposition, um, we kind of talked about this a little bit when we talked about air quality and air pollution. Um, so it's precipitation or gases that can attach to the surfaces of plants or soil or water, and it has a very low pH, hence acid. Um, so the two main thing, compounds that are responsible for this are sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide from fossil fuel combustion, especially coal combustion. Um, coal is really high in sulfur, and when it reacts with our atmosphere, um, it results in sulfur dioxide emissions. And so then sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide can combine with water vapor in the atmosphere uh, and transform into sulfuric acid and nitric acid. Um, and then when it rains, this can reduce the pH of water bodies um, to levels that are pretty dangerous for a lot of organisms. Um, so when acid rain uh, or acid deposition falls, it can defoliate trees as well. Um, and it can also weather rocks and other like human built things made out of stone. Um, in the US and in other countries that strictly regulate air pollution, um, we do use scrubbers in coal fired power plants as well as other 
uh, natural gas power plants to reduce sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide emissions. Um, uh, another source of acid and some heavy metals uh, in water sources can be acid mine drainage or um, mine, mine pond tailings. Um, so if there is an abandoned mine or a tailings pond from a mine, um, these can flood either from an increase in groundwater if it's a subsurface mine or like a, a rainstorm if it's a, a surface pond. Um, and the water can react with the minerals in that are left over in that ore in the mine um, and release hydrogen ions that acidify the water. And then the acidic water can then dissolve a lot of other compounds uh, into the water, which makes it pretty toxic for organisms, uh, including humans. And it can oftentimes turn it orange. Um, so this water becomes uninhabitable for aquatic species and a lot of times these abandoned mines, uh, they're not the responsible uh, responsibility of the company who created the mines anymore. Um, and it's often left to states to clean up these, uh, these issues. Um, another common water pollutant is synthetic organic compounds. So these can be from industrial point sources or non-point sources uh, if they're applied over large areas. So we're talking about things like pesticides that are used in agriculture, maybe pharmaceuticals um, that we flush down the, the drain, uh, military compounds, industrial compounds used in manufacturing. Um, so synthetic organic compounds are human-made carbon-based compounds um, and they can be toxic or carcinogenic or cause genetic defects or they can interfere with growth and sexual development. Um, so one group of synthetic organic compounds is pesticides. So we use these to control pest organisms that, throws, that pose a threat to crop production or human health. Um, they can have unintended impacts on non-target species. So an example of this is DDT. Um, it was designed to kill mosquitoes and it was very broadly applied. Um, however, when it gets into uh, aquatic systems, it can move up the aquatic food chain and it bioaccumulates. So it biomagnifies and it bioaccumulates in individual organisms. Um, so birds that consume fish are especially vulnerable to uh, having high levels of DDT in their body. And then it's also pretty persistent. So it stays in the body tissue for a very long time. Um, so one of the species of concern was bald eagles uh, when they consumed fish that was contaminated with DDT. Um, their eggshells for their the baby birds uh, started getting thinner and thinner um, so that they were too thin to protect the, the baby birds um, as they developed. And so that was part of the reason that the bald eagle population um, decreased significantly. So the United States banned DDT in 1972 and the rest of the world uh, followed and it's banned, I believe across the whole world now. Um, but in the United States, we pretty immediately saw bald eagles numbers start to increase um, and the bald eagles used to be listed as an endangered species, but they have since been delisted because of this ban as well as habitat protection. Um, pharmaceuticals and hormones. Uh, so when we ingest drugs um, or, or hormones, like maybe in birth control pills or something like that, um, these can, if, if our body doesn't absorb all of them, then they can leave our bodies and get into um, like the septic system. And currently we think that concentrations are low and they're not thought to pose a serious threat, but there's a lot that's not known. Um, so uh, of particular concern are hormones and drugs that mimic estrogen in particular um, and bodies of water that have higher levels of these kinds of compounds have been connected to male fish growing eggs in their testes. So again, we're, we think that they're not posing a serious threat to humans, but again, there's a lot that we don't know. So another type of synthetic organic compound uh, or a source of synthetic organic compounds is from military operations. Um, so an example of this is perchlorates, uh, which are used in rocket fuel. <coughs> um, and areas that have been 
used uh, for rocket testing and production um, have been have found really high levels of perchlorates in the soil, um, sometimes a really long time after uh, these processes were happening there. Um, industrial compounds is another source. Uh, so there are any chemicals that are used in manufacturing. So formerly in the United States, um, when manufacturing was starting up and before we had laws to regulate these things, uh, industries would just dump excess compounds that they had directly into bodies of water. This of course has since been stopped um, since we started passing more regula environmental regulations in the 70s. Um, an example of an industrial compound that is still persisting in the environment as a water pollutant are PCBs. Uh, they're a group of industrial compounds that were used to manufacture plastics, insulate electric transformers, and um, they have since been found to be responsible for a lot of environmental problems. Um, an example of a industrial compound uh, that's been problematic in North Carolina are PFAS or polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, if you've ever heard of Gen X being in the water system, um, these Gen X is a type of PFAS compounds. Um, so in 2016, a study by Dr. Sun uh, at NC State found Gen X concentrations in the Cape Fear River um, and groundwater wells around Fayetteville um, near the Kimor's chemical manufacturing plant. Um, these are generally used uh, in manufacturing of like non-stick uh, cookware as well as flame retardants for firefighting or also um, like a creating like flame retardant blankets or mattresses that uh, we use in uh, a lot of children's uh, mattresses and things like that. Um, so PFAS can be either point source or non-point source pollutants. So uh, it could be firefighting foam um, that's been sprayed on the ground. Uh, they could have products in a landfill that's leaching out. So these are non-point source. Um, it could also be directly from a manufacturing plant that's maybe making like non-stick cookware. This is a point source example. Um, and so since 2016, um, PFAS has been found in many other places. Um, a lot of the studies have been concentrated in the Cape Fear River Basin. Um, we found PFAS in Greensboro and Pittsboro um, in high concentrations as well as Fayetteville and Wilmington. Um, and this is an ongoing issue that people are trying to figure out what to do and how to regulate it. Um, another water pollutant that we often talk about is oil pollution. Um, and surprisingly, you know, you hear about like the, the oil spills and things like that, and we make a big deal out of them, which they are big deals. Um, but over half of the petroleum in the water source is from natural sources. So underground, uh, a lot of, a lot of petroleum is found deep in the ocean and that's where we mine it anyway or drill it anyway. Um, and so these uh, areas will naturally seep oil out. And But a lot of times that oil is consumed and broken down um, by bacteria that are naturally occurring in those areas. The other largest uh, source of oil pollution in our water is our consumption of petroleum. Um, so when we spill petroleum products uh, on the ground or um, and, or things like that in the process of consuming those products. And only about 5% uh, is, so a very a much smaller percent is from transporting petroleum. Um, if you've ever heard of the Exxon Valdez oil spill, that was a oil tanker ship that spilled um, or from extracting petroleum, um, which is uh, if back in 2010, um, the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, that was an extraction issue. A well exploded. So like I just mentioned, there's spills of note, um, especially in the United States that we talk about when we talk about oil spills. So the first one was the Exxon Valdez oil spill uh, in 1989. This happened in Alaska, a tanker ship carrying oil um, rep er, spilled along the coast of Alaska, and there's still to this day um, evidence of that oil spill. And then the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill in 2010. Um, so a 
a, a drilling well for um, a drilling platform and a drilling well um, in the Gulf of Mexico exploded. Uh, and that released a lot of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and again, there's still issues today. So when a spill does happen, there's a couple of ways that are commonly used to remediate spills. So booms are physical barriers that are used to contain floating oil. Some oil floats and some of it sinks. Um, and then once it's contained, they'll take basically big vacuums that are on ships and try and suck it up, uh, or they'll use specially designed sponges. Um, another common way is so this is actually like removing the oil from the ecosystem. So another common way that these are dealt with are dispersants. Um, so these are chemically similar to soap. Um, so soap is a dispersant. It chemically breaks up the oil itself, um, it kind of like encapsulates it and breaks it into smaller particles so that it will sink faster. Um, so this does not remove the oil from the ecosystem. Um, and a lot of dispersants that are commonly used can be toxic to wildlife. Um, another option is that some folks employ is to burn floating slicks. Um, so when you have like the floating oil, like you might contain with the booms, you can also just set it on fire and burn it. Um, but again, this is like releasing a lot of pollutants and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere because there's no way to filter any of those particulates out. Um, and there's also a lot of work being done on genetically engineering bacteria. Uh, that will faster, that will consume oil much more quickly. Um, there's already naturally occurring bacteria species that do, and, and, and fungi that do break down and eat oils and plastics. Um, and so people are working on genetically engineering to make them more efficient. Um, another type of water pollution that we often talk about is non-chemical pollution, also known as solid waste. Um, or garbage and the sludge that is produced by sewage treatments. Um, so in the United States, uh, before the 1980s, um, it was a decently common practice to take garbage loaded up on a barge and just dump it in the ocean uh, pretty far off of our coast. Um, we stopped doing that in the 1980s, uh, or at least dropped back on it. Um, in countries that don't have the infrastructure to properly dispose of garbage, so they don't have sanitary landfills, they don't have um, the waste energy incinerators, um, are tend to be the biggest um, sources of especially plastics in the ocean. Um, so these countries tend lack the income um, to, to create that infrastructure, um, but they also lack the income to purchase longer term use products. So there's being a lot of pressure that's put on companies that produce single use plastics. So um, I remember a while ago, there was a, a news story about uh, fairly low income communities where people would go and they would buy like a single use packet of shampoo or dish soap or something like that in a plastic packet that's disposable. So these folks don't have the infrastructure to properly dispose of that. Um, so it's just gonna get dropped on the ground. And um, they're actually spending a lot more money buying these individual little packets that are so cheap than if they were to have the money upfront to buy a larger container um, that they could reuse or uh, dispose of better. Um, so these are from the chemical and engineering news magazine, um, the largest source of plastics in our ocean is from cigarette butts and plastic beverage bottles and plastic bottle caps. So switching over to reusable um, water bottles instead of these one-time disposable plastics is a great idea. Um, and then a lot the countries that are the the that a lot of the plastic in the ocean has been traced back to are a lot of oceans um, in, or a lot of countries in the uh, Western part of the Pacific Basin. Another non-chemical pollutant um, is sediment. So sediment is one of the top pollutants found in waterways. About 30% of it comes from natural sources. So like if there's just a big rain and riverbanks tend to, to wash out and erode, um, 
or or something like that. That's a natural source. 70% um, of sediment in waterways can be traced back to human activities. So this might be like a construction site that people cleared the trees and the grass off of, um, and then maybe they didn't put any ground cover back. And so when it rains, just all that loose dirt just washes into um, a nearby river or into a storm drain. So sedimentation is a problem because it reduces the infiltration of sunlight. Um, and so it lowers the productivity of aquatic plants and algae. And so these are the things in the water that are taking up nutrients. Um, that can cause algal blooms and low oxygen levels. These are also the things in water that add oxygen to the water. Um, so it makes it not, and they're also the base of the, the food web in aquatic ecosystems. Um, so it's not really ideal for, um, for um, organisms that live there. Um, sediment floating around in the water can also clog gills, not clog gills, clog gills of fish and it can prevent aquatic organisms from obtaining oxygen, which again is not ideal. So sediment control is really important. Um, so a lot of times at construction sites, you'll see uh, like these big rolls of straw at the bottom of a hill to kind of prevent a sediment from going places um, on highway construction. If you guys will notice like one day, maybe you'll see them clear out all the grass and the trees and the next day they'll plant grass seed and they'll spread hay on top of it. Um, to kind of prevent erosion there. Um, when you guys go out to collect uh, your water samples, if you're near a, a, a street or something like that, a lot of times you'll see big um, rocks that people have put along a stream bank to kind of prevent erosion. So we'll see that if you guys come out with me to Burdens Creek. Um, another issue is thermal pollution. So from the the thermal electro power generation um, that we commonly use that results in, and then other things that would result in us heating up water and then putting it back into the source that we got it from, um, that can change a substantial, cause a substantial change in the temperature of the water. And this can result in thermal shock to organisms if it's a lot higher than what they're used to, uh, which can kill organisms. Um, Warmer water also, it can't hold as much dissolved gases, so it can't hold as much dissolved oxygen. Um, so that can deplete oxygen level in, um, in bodies of water as well, which means that it can't support as much wildlife. A common solution is to have cooling towers that release the excess heat into the atmosphere instead of the water. Um, noise pollution is another, type of uh, pollution found in water. This impacts animals that um, use sound to navigate or communicate when they're underwater. Um, so sounds that are emitted by ships and submarines, they can interfere with animal communication, uh, especially if there's loud sonar. So we send out little audible pings um, that then we bounce off the, the the ground and come back to the sensors um, and that helps us figure out like what the the land is like underneath the water so that maybe like ships don't run aground and things like that um, but they can negatively impact species especially like whales that rely on low frequency uh, noises for long distance communication so um, to to people are becoming more and more aware of this and um, starting to design ships that have quieter propellers um, and sometimes countries can, or cities can require um, that big ships avoid known migration routes of, of whales and other animals that use um, sonar to uh, communicate. So some laws in the United States that we have to protect our water quality. Um, one of the big ones is the Clean Water Act. This was enacted in 1972. Um, there were other acts that preceded this, but this is a little bit more comprehensive. Um, so it supports the protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife and recreation in and on the water. Um, it allows the EPA to make regulations that help maintain and when necessary, restore surface water. So the Clean Water Act only applies to surface waters um, that are navigable. And the definition of navigable has changed over the years, depending on the administration. Um, so 
the, this allows the EPA to issue water quality standards for both point source pollution as well as non-point source pollution. Um, non-point source pollution is of course much harder to regulate and it is one of, it is probably the biggest source of uh, water pollution in areas, in, in surface water. Um, so the other main law uh, in the US that governs water is the Safe Water Drinking Act. Um, the first version was passed in 1974 and then it's been amended and repassed several times since. So this sets national standards for safe drinking water. Um, and so you can see what the maximum contaminant level of um, some of these compounds is. Uh, so it allows the EPA to set these maximum contaminant levels um, for 77 different elements uh, in both surface water and groundwater that are used for drinking water. Um, and a maximum contaminant level is a standard that's set by the EPA that says like, okay, well, if you consume this much of this contaminant, it's probably safe still. Um, so the these two water laws have been very effective. Um, however, there are there is still a lot of work to do. So this is a map of North Carolina I pulled from the Division of Water Resources, um, and it shows impaired streams. So the Clean Water Act has a section 303, um, and that requires uh, states to list waters that have high levels of pollution, whether it's sediment, which is a lot of times the case, or other pollutants. Um, and you can see all these red lines here um, that are considered impaired waters. So uh, over here in your book, this is table uh, 54.2 from your book. Um, so this shows the uh, cause of uh, impaired waterways in the United States. So a lot of times um, it is uh, in wetlands and streams and rivers, um, it excess nutrients or organic enrichment. You can see that in a lot of these. Um, and that comes from agriculture uh, as well as runoff from human or like individual citizens' lawns. Um, and then the others are heavy metals and uh, bacteria and things like that that we already discussed. All right. Um, so again, safe drinking water is clearly a very important thing. I like to drink clean water. I'm sure you do too. Um, there is an interesting video uh, by Mark Rober um, on these PNG, PG and e, or yeah, PNG Procter and Gamble um, clean water packets, water filtration like in a packet um, that they send to developing countries who don't have the infrastructure like we do um, to provide clean water. So this is an interesting watch. Um, if you want to watch that later, I'm not going to play it for you now because if I put this on YouTube, there'll be copyright issues. I'm sure. Um, but highly recommend it. It's interesting. It also explains um, why providing humanitarian aid to other countries, developing countries, is super important to the world's economy, to the U.S. economy as well. All right. Thank you guys for watching. Um, hopefully this was helpful and let me know if you have any questions.